There's something new happening on the high street. It's 2016 now and it's about time that there is modest fashion that's available to us. You know, it's a really up and coming, growing trend. From fashion to fast food, more and more stores seem to be spotting a gap in the market. When you have something like Dolce & Gabbana or DKNY running a Ramadan campaign, people sit up and say, oh, hold on, there's a really big market here. Traditional British favourites are getting a new twist. How easy is it to convince Muslim consumers to go for a sausage roll? Yeah, it, it is a little hard. I'm Miriam Francois, a journalist and a British Muslim. I want to find out why our high street stores are so interested in Muslim consumers. Retailers, quite cynically, have been looking for the next opportunity, the next area of growth. And whether that attention is actually a good thing. I just don't understand why a mainstream high street retailer would pander to conservative voices within Muslim communities. I was wondering if I could speak to you about some of your halal products. Why do so many high street brands seem reluctant to talk about it? Now that the big operators are serving halal, I feel they might well put off customers. And how likely is it that the stores will stick with it? The global Muslim spend on all apparel and footwear will be 484 billion by 2019. Of course brands want a piece of that market. As the Muslim month of Ramadan comes to an end, I ask, is the Muslim pound here to stay? And are we all ready for brand Islam? Saturday morning, an accused forming for London's Muslim lifestyle show. Olympia actually stated that they haven't had this many phone calls on this. It's the ideal home exhibition. The show has attracted some well-known faces, including Citizen Khan's Amjad. We could make a lemon drizzle cake. That's my mummy's favourite. What are the ingredients? Lemons <laughs> and drizzle. This is the first time I've come to somewhere like this, and it's blown my mind, honestly. The amount of variety here, all selling or promoting different things, and it's really exciting just to walk around and see. And also, MasterChef winner, Shalina Permalu. Our MasterChef champion is Shalina. I think it's really interesting. It's such a massive market in the UK, and it's relatively unknown. Um, so I think in terms of a business opportunity, it's clearly working. It's absolutely rammed in here today. Muslim shoppers are starting to feel like they matter. Maybe 10 years ago, the high streets weren't catering to that as much. Now there seems to be almost everything you can think of, they found a way to kind of put a Muslim spin on it. There's been a massive change uh, in, in the perception towards Muslims as uh, you know, a source of revenue for many companies. It's, you know, small sweets like Haribo's are catching on to it and it's becoming popular within the Muslim community. So if you run a business, it's about making money, right? And if you're not making money out of that community, then I think you're missing a trick, really. The Muslim community represents in the order of 5% of the UK population and their total spending power is over £20 billion a year. By investing in advertising and product ranges that do appeal to that community, they will boost their sales and of course that adds to their bottom line profitability. Some high street big names certainly seem to be thinking more about their Muslim consumers. So this is the early stage of the market and we start to see brands that are actually pioneering this market and that makes it really exciting. So we have big brands that are starting to feature Muslim women, for example, like Apple, an Android, Jeep, Coca-Cola. In fashion, H&M led the way with a distinctive campaign. Dress like a teen. Stand out, blend in. Mixed prints, mixed pink and red. Its recycling campaign featured models of all shapes and sizes, different ages and genders. But it was one woman in particular who got everyone talking. It was this image which really caught everyone's attention. Although, to be fair, if you blinked, you'd probably miss it. It was the first time that the company used a Muslim woman in a headscarf in a campaign. There are no rules in fashion but one 
recycle your clothes. The woman featured in the campaign was overwhelmed by the response. It was massive. It was huge. Everyone saw it as a breakthrough. Um, there was an article that compared me to like the first black model in history. But now I've seen it, I've, I've realized how almost primitive we were. Like in 2015, the first time we're seeing a girl in a headscarf being used for like a major retailer. And I thought, wow, as much as it's incredible, we're still so far away from obviously achieving this diversity. Since the campaign, Maria has been in demand to talk about her experience. Hello and assalamu alaikum. I want you to realize that just the fact that we are seeing hijab and abaya in mainstream fashion in the media, it makes people understand that there is another side to Islam. If we can't change the negative, why not add a positive to it? For me personally, hijab, again, it's a way of life, and it makes me represent Islam. That's the reason that I started to wear it, to basically distinguish ourselves as believing women. So it's not just, you know, a piece of material on my head. It is more than that. But is the high street ready to give space on the shop floor to clothes that women like Maria want to buy? We know that there's a wider consumer trend about women who are also looking for clothes that suit their, their demeanour, their aspiration to, to be more modest. You know, for me personally, I want to wear stuff that isn't too clingy, isn't too transparent, like the necklines aren't too plunging. But shopping for clothes that are in keeping with the spirit of that ideal has traditionally been quite challenging on the high street. We're all familiar with the idea that sex sells. But are things changing? What's quite interesting about this dress is that it's not being marketed as Muslim as such, but actually it would probably appeal to quite a lot of more conservative Muslim women. In 2014, DKNY launched a special Ramadan collection for its markets in the Middle East. A year later, Mango, Monsoon, Tommy Hilfiger all offered Ramadan collections. At the start of this year, Uniqlo worked with British Muslim and designer Hannah Tajima. So what I'm wearing at the moment is a long wrap dress. And Italian fashion house Dolce & Gabbana launched its first range of traditional dresses called abayas. To understand what's driving the interest, you need to look on the internet. From cool American mipsters, that's Muslim hipsters. Click on that if you'd like to go and watch that video. To UK-based fashion and beauty bloggers, young Muslim women are going online. So what you want to do is you want to grab your scarf, and I've already folded mine in a few inches. And just pin it under, like that. And then just bring it around, like so. Nabila B has been posting videos on YouTube since she was 16 years old. I hope you guys enjoyed that, and if you want to see more videos from me, then just click the subscribe button down below, and I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye. Well done. Thanks. So how often do you do these then? Um, so I film YouTube videos every three days. Wow, and how did you get into that? I was in school, I was around about like 15, and I was going through a hard time of wearing my hijab, and I was kind of struggling. I was kind of getting bullied that I wasn't pretty enough when I wore the scarf. I started doing my own styles, and people on the street used to be like, oh, so how did you do that style? And I was like, you know what, I think I need to make YouTube videos as well and show people how to do it. One of the things that's very important about these bloggers is that I think they need to be taken seriously as influencers. Influences. For example, lots of young women who start wearing hijab, and some of the wraps are very elaborate and difficult to achieve, Le they're learning this from watching YouTube, from watching video bloggers. They're not learning it from their moms. How influential do you think bloggers like yourself are on the trends that we're now seeing within the high street? I think really influential because we've got so many followers. Um, brands have realized that and have seen that. I think it's really amazing what they're doing and that they're finally seeing us. Are they seeing Muslims or are they just seeing pound signs? 
to be honest i think it's a win-win situation like it, their business so obviously they're going to be thinking about money and how they can make more but at the same time i think it really benefits us because we need modest clothing also don't but recognising this interest in modest clothing is only part of the issue for high street stores. Last year, Marks & Spencer introduced a swimming costume that it had already sold overseas. This was the item in question, a swimsuit which covers the head, arms and legs, marketed as the burkini. It covers the whole body except the face, hands and feet. So what's all the fuss? There were criticisms from fashion moguls, from uh, the French Minister for Equalities and Women, um, saying that this is just a further oppression of women and of women's rights. If M&S had collaborated with Nadia Hussein from the Great British Bake Off and done a halal cupcake range, I don't think anyone would have been bothered by it. People would probably have said, oh, it tastes delicious, I must get some. So I think it brought up a lot of anxieties about what does it mean to be British? Some of the criticism came from Muslims themselves. I just don't understand why a mainstream high street re retailer would only want to um, pander to conservative voices within Muslim communities. Especially for Muslims like myself, who'd, who made the decision not to cover our hair. And this is actually quite a difficult decision to make in Muslim communities when you consider that a lot of women are actually ostracised for taking off their headscarves, women who might be perfectly happy with wearing a regular one-piece swimsuit, but might be shamed in years to come if the burkini becomes normalised in Muslim communities. Many young women who wear the headscarf will say it's about choice and that they feel that it's a good thing that the high street is finally recognising them. I can totally understand the excitement. Um, of course, they, they want to see their particular way of dressing acknowledged and recognised by these big high street retailers. Who wouldn't? But at the same time, we have to be wary that this doesn't become an excuse for uh, pushing modesty doctrines. When we asked Marks & Spencer if I could come and talk to them about the burkini, they responded instead by saying they provide a wide range of swimwear to offer customers lots of choice. They've sold the burkini for a number of years and it's popular with customers internationally. The fact is, m and is a huge retailer in the UK and internationally. They spend a lot of money knowing and understanding their customer. And if they felt there was a need to develop that product, then they knew there was a demand. They made the decision to stock a product because there are customers that will buy it. I also wanted to talk to H&M about their inclusion of Maria in her headscarf in their campaign. But they didn't provide anyone to be interviewed either. They said everyone is welcome at H&M and they never take a religious or political stand. Their advertising campaigns target a wide and diverse audience and they do not convey any specific ideal or encourage a choice of lifestyle. I am certain that there will be an enormous amount of analysis going on to ensure that those stores are treading that very fine line between not alienating the core traditional shopper whilst ensuring they do take some of that £20 billion per annum spending that comes out of the Muslim community. It's not only in the world of fashion that the Muslim pound is attracting the attention of big name brands. Ramadan is, of course, a month of fasting, but at the end of each day, there's iftar, the evening meal when we break our fast. And at the end of Ramadan, there's a major celebration, Eid. For supermarkets, that all means big sales. Ramadan is said to have boosted sales to 100 million for, for these grocery stores. So they're really reaching out to the market and the market is very, very grateful for these options. 
They've invested more and more in engaging with the Muslim community to prove that they are able to support their needs and wants, both for their key festivities, but also for the rest of the year. With the sales potential of Ramadan well established in the supermarkets, it was really only a matter of time before somebody spotted a gap in the market during the rest of the year. For Muslims, the weekly shop involves looking for halal products. Halal in Arabic simply means permissible. It rules out things like pork or anything containing alcohol. They're haram or forbidden. Looking for halal alternatives becomes a way of life when you're a Muslim. We all make conscious little adaptations, like picking the fish or veggie option when you're out for dinner with friends. But I'm off to meet a woman who got so fed up with not being able to eat what she wanted that she decided to do something about it. Hello, thank you. So this is the uh, factory here? Shazia Salim's a halal entrepreneur with a company that produces halal everyday favourites, sausage rolls, pasties and pies. A sausage roll does really well um, and the creamy chicken pie as well, that's probably our second best seller. One of my biggest frustrations has been not being able to partake in Britain's love affair with food. You know, it's, you're kind of limited to food from sort of where your parents are from. Um, or, or fried chicken. I, I think when I was at university, actually, is when I sort of first had the idea of, hang on, this, this can't be quite right. Why am I spending all of my money buying tuna mayonnaise sandwiches and cheese and onion pasties? Like, surely, why can't I buy lasagna? Why can't I have a shepherd's pie? And that's kind of where the frustration came about. All of these products are kind of done as you would do at home, but it's just on a bigger scale. How easy is it to convince Muslim consumers to go for a sausage roll? Yeah, it, it is a little hard because, you know, to most Muslims, the word sausage means pork, it means haram, and therefore people might be a bit nervous about it. Um, we have put the word beef in front of it to get people to recognise that it's made with beef. Um, and then there's a, a very prominent um, halal logo. Whilst halal meat has to be slaughtered according to Islamic tradition, there are different opinions on what that means. In British law, animals have to be stunned before slaughter, and over three quarters of halal meat is stunned. But for some, it is only halal if it hasn't been stunned, so there are exemptions on religious grounds. The halal industry faces a lot of criticism over the use of unstunned meat. Where do you stand on stunned or unstunned? Uh, no, we use unstunned meat. For me, it's, it's important that I avoid doubt. The majority of meat in the UK is stunned. Uh, and that's because the best practice guidelines advise stunning as a more humane way. Do you see a conflict there with halal? The, the controversy, I think, that um, plagues um, halal slaughter and unstunned halal slaughter in particular is the, the, is the misunderstanding that it's some sort of barbaric uh, procedure. It, what happens is there tends to be uh, some bad practice of it. But to be honest, that bad practice happens in both stunned, unstunned, halal, non-halal industries. That's, that is a bad abattoir that is not necessarily specific to the halal procedure itself. And out on the high street, there's certainly a growing demand for halal options. In 2014, Tayyab Mushtaq went on TV investment show Dragon's Den to try and secure funding for a chain of fast food stores selling wraps. Good afternoon, Dragons. I'm here today seeking an investment of £500,000 for an exchange of 11% equity in our business. Despite a promising initial pitch, Tayyab and Afnan are leaving empty-handed. So I'm really sorry, but I'm out. Tayyab has gone on to open 14 stores so far selling halal wraps. How much would you say that your business success is down to spotting a gap in the market? Though our predominant customer base is 80% non-halal, if you look at 20% of our customer base, which is Muslim, that equates to around the profitability of our business. So had we not had the Muslim customers, maybe we'd just be breaking even. Number 91. 
in light of that, how much opportunity do you think there is for other entrepreneurs for tapping into the halal market? There's Muslim populations across the UK um, and they're all in need for halal food. And, and if you can fill that space, there's no reason why any new business or new operator can't be successful. Many of the big name fast food chains are recognizing the demand. Finding somewhere to eat halal is increasingly easy. As Nabila B discovered in a blog checking out the dining options at the Intu Trafford Center in Manchester. So yeah, the Nando's is halal, the chicken's halal, so I can eat there. Excuse me. Hi, is the meat halal here? The chicken? Uh, chicken steak. The chicken steak, OK, thank you. So there's McDonald's and Burger King here. They are not halal. However, obviously, you can get like the veggie option if you want. And they are halal as well. Surprisingly, there are a lot of halal places. I thought there'll only be like two or three. But as more and more fast food restaurants choose to cater for the halal diner, some are finding it attracts unwanted attention. been a bit of a media backlash against some of the retailers and particularly the food retailers for moving towards halal and suggestions that as it's only 5% of the market why are they doing that? Why not just increase consumer choice for everyone rather than reducing the choice for those who are not Muslim and who may not even identify as religious. But what about businesses in Muslim majority areas where it does make business sense to I cater? I would say the country as a whole is still a non-Muslim majority country. Therefore, why should the dietary needs of a small minority have to, have to dominate those of everybody else? Hi, I was wondering if I could speak to you about some of your halal products. We asked some of these restaurants for an interview about the issues around halal. So Nando said they didn't have anyone to speak to us on their behalf. They referred us to their website, which says about a fifth of their restaurants serve only halal chicken, which is signposted. A small proportion of chicken in other restaurants is also halal and is not currently labelled when served. The quality, health and welfare of their chicken is a priority and they are pre-stunned before slaughter. Subway said, unfortunately, we are unable to take part. KFC said that they were very busy and didn't have the capacity to dedicate to our request. Pizza Express referred us to a statement. It said the chicken they currently use is halal certified. But none of their meals or restaurants are halal because of other non-halal ingredients in their kitchens. Their chicken supplier meets the highest welfare standards and all the birds are stunned pre-slaughter. Frankly, I find it all a bit disappointing. If these stores are happy enough to take my money, I'd hope they'd be prepared to talk about it. When we talk about it, basically we're creating that polarisation in the market. We're drawing too much attention to the commerciality of what's actually happening in the retail environment. So I would say it's probably more a case of keeping their head down, doing what they do and not drawing too much attention to themselves. But some retailers have no hesitation in upfront marketing to halal shoppers. When it comes to my makeup and creams, I don't tend to look at the ingredients that closely. Some of the products probably do contain alcohol, but I figure as long as I'm not consuming it, that's not really an issue. Having said that, I can understand why some people might prefer, say, a collagen cream that wasn't pig-derived. There's already a booming trade in health and beauty products. They avoid chemicals and often alcohol too. Many are cruelty-free, so they don't use animal products. It's not difficult to see why, for some, Muslim consumers would be a target market. There's all sorts of certification on this packaging. You've got against animal testing, 100% vegan, and the new kid on the block, 100% halal.
Rose Brown was just 22 when she became the UK's youngest franchiser, selling a range of vegan, cruelty-free and halal-certified beauty products. I use cosmetics that contain alcohol because I sort of think, well, as long as I'm not consuming alcohol, then, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's in my products. So, I mean, why is there a need for halal certification? If you are using a lipstick which contains animal-derived ingredients, specifically, you know, animal fats derived from pigs, then a lot of the time that is being ingested into the body. You know, you can apply lipstick all day and a lot of that is actually ingested or can be absorbed in through the skin. And so some consumers do feel that they would actually much rather use a product that is completely free from these ingredients. What would you say to people who regard halal certification as a bit of a marketing ploy, just a way of accessing another sort of niche market? It. People might think that it's just a ploy or a plot, but actually what it does do is give people real peace of mind. It lets them look at a product and say, I know that someone here has put the care and the hard work into ensuring that this product is completely free from ingredients that I wish to avoid. And I think really a lot of people appreciate that. Cosmetics, food, fashion. The halal market seems to be growing wider by the day. So there's this notion called blue ocean strategy, which literally creates this new market demand where there is none. And I think that is what's happening with this brand Muslim. If we think about 10 years ago, nobody needed a smartphone. Yet I'm pretty sure here and now, most people do own a smartphone. That is a need that we didn't know we have, that the retail and consumer markets created. We're really talking about the principles of good retailing. You can see this in action by checking the range of goods now offering halal certification. Here's Nabila's blog again. So the fa first one, obviously, you've got your Haribos, and they all have the halal stamp on them, and so are the chocolates. And then the one that I found really weird was just basically liquid wash for your clothes, instant noodles, and then I got these Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Yeah, and the stamp here is at the back as well, right next to the vegetarian. And even on the bread, which is really surprising, it's got the halal stamp. I think it, it plays on Muslim identity politics, which I think is a really negative trend within Muslim communities. The Muslim lifestyle is seen as someone who uses halal beard oil, who paints their nails with halal nail varnish, who wears burkinis from m &S, who lives their life in, in what I would term quite a restrictive way, uh, where their religious identity sort of trumps all other identities. We've seen an enormous change in the last two years. I wasn't sure it would ever happen. The high street catering to and seeking out, soliciting Muslim shoppers. Big brands are reaching out to Muslim audiences and that was something that should be celebrated because we're not really recognised often, and this is like taking off. I definitely see us growing. I don't think it's reached its peak, to be honest. I think there's so much more that can be done, and that is being done. It does seem like there's going to be more choice on the high street, as stores increasingly recognise the value of the Muslim pounds. And if that encourages us all to think a little harder about how and where we spend our cash, then surely that can only really be a good thing.